wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. Give me a full ballerina skirt and a hint of saloon and I'm on board. Mm. Welcome to the She Became Visible podcast. I'm your host, Renee Steelman. This podcast is my story. It's your story. It's our story. It's all the stories of all the women who one day knew that it was time to remember who they were, who they are, and stand up and be seen. Hello. Welcome. It is March 9th, 2023. I am Renee Steelman, your host of She Became Visible. And I am so pleased today. I have as my guest, Jackie Reedman, and I've invited Lila Tuller to co-host with me today because Lila and I both met Jackie at a Thrive meeting in St. George, Utah a month or so ago. And since Lila was there and um, we both were able to listen to Jackie, I'll have her talk about that a little bit. Um, It was just a a really amazing weekend. And so I wanted Lila to join us today. So let me bring Lila and Jackie on. And we're going to talk about our Thrive experience, how we met. And then we're highlighting today Jackie Riedemann's story of how she became visible. And my sound and my mouth are off. And I don't know. It's because I'm sitting in a town suite Marriott Hotel in Houston, Utah. Houston, Utah. Oh, well, (laughs) Houston, Texas, that the internet is weird. So it's going to be a weird streaming thing. So Lila and Jackie, there you are. Hello. Good morning. So hopefully, hopefully your mouth and your your words and your mouth will be moving at the same time. Otherwise, I'll just pretend like I'm in a Japanese dubbed movie and we'll just go from there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Ah! So you look, it's working for me. It's right it working. Yeah. OK, so it might just be the it might just be the recording. So whatever. So Jackie, Alila and I uh, and we all attended the St. George uh, Thrive event that was held, um, gosh, I swear, I'm traveling way too much. I can't keep track of where I'm at or or who I'm with anymore. But was it just a couple of weeks ago or how long ago was it? Almost it a was, month, three weeks ago. Yeah, I, I want to say almost a month. Yeah, yeah not. that'd be a wary, the last weekend in February, right? Yeah, yeah that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I so just realized you can see like yeah. <laughs> I forgot to shut the door. Okay, I'm shutting. Yeah, that's okay because it's a craft closet and it just shows how fabulously crafty you are. (laughs) Oh, whatever. Yeah, it's a mess. Anyway, okay. So the weekend at Thrive, we had some fabulous speakers. And at the very end, one of the last speakers was John DeLynn and he opened it up for question and answer. And Jackie very patiently waited in line. And And then Jackie, tell a little bit about what you asked John. Well, I don't think I actually asked him a question. Um, he had said that they needed that they needed more diversity in voices in their broadcasting world, that there was a need for more women, more people of color, yeah, more women, yay, more people of color, more people of, of the LGBTQ community, um, more people that spoke Spanish. I think he said even maybe more older people. I'm not even really sure. So um, I waited in line and I said that I fit most of that demographic, that I (laughs) belong to the LGBT community, that I'm a woman, obviously. Um, That's how I identify um, and that I speak Spanish and uh, it's not my primary language, but I do speak Spanish. And then I am of that older demographic. And um, I also that I would I would offer him my story as well to be told. And I would be more than willing to, you know, start this podcasting journey and mm-hmm. um, 
that was kind of how I introduced myself to John and to the community, the, the people that was, were there. And um, right. yeah. And then I'd been married to my wife and, and I told a little bit of my, my personal story. Right. So, right. Yeah. And what I loved the most was every, all of those three things. Number one, um, you know, being, when I go to these thrive events, the thrive events that I've been to, there is a demographic that I would say is probably, what would you guys say? 30 to 50, I think might be the majority. Um, there are people in my demographic, which I'm at least I'm 10 years older than you are, Jackie. Um, there are people that in my age group, but most of the ones that we've met are couples mm -hmm. that have left the church together. Yep. And so to find mixed faith marriages in my age category, um, there are a few, but I, I don't see a lot. And I don't hear a lot of female voices mm -hmm. in my demographic. I, I hear a lot of men who have true believing uh, wives, but they themselves have left the church and they're, they're my age. Um, so I loved what you said as far as every qualification that you said that uh, Spanish speaking, huge demographic in that area. And then older people who have, you know, we talk about history when we talk about the older temple ceremony to some of the 30 and 40 year olds, that's, that might as well be 1830 for them, yeah. you know, yeah. mm -hmm. they have but, no reference to that. Yeah. Right. They don't, <laughs> no, idea. no, no loud laughing and the a blood atonement. And yeah, they just don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. All and, the, and all the penalties, they, yeah. Yeah. The five, they, they almost look at you like, uh, uh, yeah. No. The five points of fellowship. They're like, what yes, are you talking that one about? Too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I think because of that, because of that separation, they don't understand that it wasn't that long ago and that it's not because there is that mindset in all of the different categories well, that was a long time ago and we've gotten better or that was a long time ago. Things have changed. We can't be presentism. We can't go back and judge people for what happened in 1830. And it's like, but could we go back to 2018? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I loved and that was one of the things I loved about your story was it seems like everything uh, that is maybe on people's list of why they're struggling with their their belief in the church. You have lived. Yes. But I found it fascinating when you gave me your timeline because I'm like, but she's still there. And then I go down, but she's still there. <laughs> so, so I know. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. So start at I I want to I want rather than read your biography, I want to live it, you know, kind of on the timeline that you presented. So you talked about how that your um, father was a convert, but that you didn't have that typical Mormon. Uh, you were that family in the right. ward, right? Would you say that? Tell that story. Yeah. So um, we weren't, we weren't the, at that time, what the word was active, right? We were the less active family in the, fam in the ward. And my, my parents were not married in the temple. They were not because my father had converted when I was three or four. I'm the oldest of three. And so we didn't go to church every Sunday. We, in fact, we were gone many Sundays. My dad was the only, um, my dad worked, my mother was a stay at home mother um, during the seventies, which was very nice. And so we didn't go to church every Sunday and therefore we weren't the active, you know, very busy in the family. My mother wasn't in the Relief Society. She wasn't in the primary. She didn't have the callings. Um, so we were the family that was, but we weren't, you know, um, we were that less active or maybe in the seventies, we were still called Jack Mormons, oh. um, that kind of a family, if you remember that term. Right. Oh, and, yeah. um, yeah. So, and I lived in uh, the west side of Salt Lake City. So as you can imagine, very, at that time, it was very, very LDS. And so, you know, you were, you were judged on how active your family was, even within the elementary school that I went to. So the PTA was ran by the Mormon moms. If you were in yeah. the, if you were in the Relief Society and the 
pr primary presidency and the Sunday school presidency and all that stuff, you were in the PTA. And since my mom wasn't in all of that, we, she wasn't in the PTA. And it became very evident in elementary school that if your mother wasn't part of that, you didn't get the jobs like, oh, I don't know, crossing guard or, you know, remember the people that the kids that were in the hall monitors and all of that. So mm -hmm. it was very much, um, I learned those lessons pretty young <laughs> that the church ruled things outside of just the chapel. Right. Oh. And yeah. So uh, the ward was very much the ward that ruled how things, how things ran in right. other places as well as just the ward. And um, Isn't that interesting. Yeah. I think that's fascinating that even outside of Utah um, in, when in our high school, which there was a pretty good size LDS community in our high school. Um, but the, the head coach, I remember the head coach of my, of my kids' football team was very active in a Baptist church. And it drove him crazy that so many of these really great athletes that were in pretty prominent positions in different you know, athletic events were LDS drove him mm -hmm. crazy. And, you know, he tried to get people to come over and watch the God Makers movie and stuff like that. And he's a great man. He's a very kind man. But it, I know it was a source of contention that, like you said, on a lot of authoritative positions, the PTA and things like that, there's still a strong LDS because I just think that's how we were wired. Like, yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, it's like training from three on. Yeah, but it's amazing how quickly kids pick up on that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, your mom's in the PTA, so or your mom's active, you know, in the track, so uh, I might not be picked to, you know, to run that field event because the, her son's going to run that field event because she's active in the track. You know, I mean, that's so. It's that's not just LDS. That's very, very. But it's amazing how quickly kids pick that up. Yeah, I remember having a big argument with my mom in fourth grade. We were doing um, the, the Nutcracker as, oh. as a school, right? And I didn't try out for part. And I was a dancer. I danced growing up. And um, I was a dancer. My mom was like, why didn't you try out? And I'm like, mom, what's the point? <laughs> I'm oh not going to get a role, right? I mean, yeah. I'm not going to get picked for anything mm -hmm. because I'm not going to get picked. I'm not going to get chosen. So mad at me. She was so mad at me that I didn't try out for anything. Well, it ended up they didn't have enough people. So I ended up being a sugar plum fairy for this thing. I hated it. Absolutely hated it. But oh. I mean, the point was, it was like, you know, what's the point of trying out? You know, I mean, I knew I wasn't going to get a role. <laughs> it was like ridiculous to even even try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm so unfamiliar with the Utah when people say, oh, I'm in Cache Valley or I was, you know, in the, mm -hmm. the I don't know why. Why is it that you people in Utah refer to your counties? Well, this is such I don't a know. Such county. <laughs> I, was like, I don't know because I grew up in I grew up in the west side of Salt Lake City. So I don't know about those other people. <laughs> 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 Interesting. Did you find that, Lila, when you were growing up, was there also a strong emphasis of leadership in the schools and other things that reflected the ward leadership? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no question that's that was the case. It was like um, the active, you know, like the opposite of what Jackie's family was. You know, they're really, uh, the, I don't know how to put it the elite, I guess you could mm -hmm. say they, they ran everything. It was, it's not in, in Salt Lake city. It's like the church runs everything, yeah. everything. Um, the, it's the shopping malls, it's the restaurants, it's the, the schools, it's everything. Um, and yes, if you're not in that, you know, that group or considered to be a part of that group, then you are over in the, you know, on the wrong side of the tracks, basically. Mm -hmm. And you just, I get it. I get what you're yeah. saying. You knew you weren't going to get a part, mm -hmm. which is so, it's tragic, you know, because it's really, it's like a bubble there. It's not like there that everywhere there is, and I guess there are some areas where the, there's a Catholic influence or a Jewish influence that sort of does the same thing in their, you know, respective area. But yeah, Utah and especially the Salt Lake area, it, I think it's probably all of Utah. Right. It's very right. much run by the church. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think because I we have a, a lay ministry, there isn't that power that you get. You might have a strong 
uh, in the subgroups, like you say, PTA or whatever, with people that are just society uh, dynastic. But but because we have this lay ministry, this position of relief society president, you know, her some outside it would be well a junior league. You know, yeah. she, there. You know, so it's already right. uh, already a society uh, outside of a religion, but there's still a power dynamic. But it's still a secular society position, and mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's that's just humanity. But it's more so in the church. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, and it, and it wasn't any better in 1990 when my wife was looking for a job. She'd graduated from BYU in teaching and education. And she was looking for a job teaching in Utah in Salt Lake area. Um, Cause that's where I was teaching. But anyway, and she would go in for interviews and the people she was interviewing with would say, well, I know the, the daughter of my Bishop or the daughter of my uh -huh. state president. And, and I mean, and she knew right then she wasn't getting the job. She was uh -huh. just being interviewed because they had to interview X amount of people. Right. Uh, yeah. Interesting. That so was that in 1990. Yeah. So who knows who was still very popular, only it's a different who in, yeah. in when you live in Utah. Oh, I'm so glad I never had to live in the bubble. <laughs> well, talk talk a little bit about I like when you said that your teenage years were a little bit tumultuous, especially when when they had the um, uh, release time seminary. I thought, oh, I want to hear that story because yeah, I grew up with only, elaborate. you know, I grew up in the Midwest, and so it was never part of the school system. Right. Uh, so I don't even know what that was like having a, a, an elective. Oh, but my tell, God. Tell me what that story is about. So as time went on, I got a little bit re rebellious. I must admit, I, I, I graduated from primary. I did that. I would go, you know, I could walk to church. So if my mom wasn't going or whatever, sometimes I'd take my sisters. I'd walk to church. I managed to graduate from primary, memorize all this stuff, do all this you know, pass, pass all the things and glue them onto my little banner and all that kind of stuff and, and border it and, you know, graduate from primary. So moved on into yeah, um, young women's, but then they split our ward and they oh. split it in a fact that they um, put us with the new people, which was, I was the eldest person in the ward and everybody that I had grown up with and gone to church with, and I was in school with was in the older ward. And they said, uh, no, nope, you can't attend that ward. Yeah. You cannot put your records in that ward. You cannot go to that ward. And there was no one my age of my ward. And oh, that's my. when I said, ugh, this is horrible. Right. And I just kind of got really rebellious. And once I got kicked out of a dance because I wore my sleeves didn't have, you know, the right length sleeves and it, it was a big thing. And I started to say things in young women's like um, they'd say, well, you need to date people who are, you know, you need to prepare to get married in the temple. And I'd say, well, what if I don't marry someone who's Mormon? Like my dad wasn't Mormon. You know, they didn't like me very much. So, <laughs> and the other thing, the pot. <laughs> yeah, I did that a lot. And the other thing was I was super involved with um, Girl Scouts of Utah. Oh. And at this point, once you get past sixth grade in Utah, and I don't know how it is outside of Utah, but girls drop out of Girl Scouting because right. they get young women and you don't need right. Girl Scouting, right? Right. But I kept Girl Scouting. That was my thing. And um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I'm still in touch with all my Girl Scouting friends, my best friend in the world. Um, she's, you know, we're still best friends and we're having a reunion this summer. A lot of, a bunch of us have been friends for like, you know, 40 years now. And, oh. and so we're a very, very tight group. And I, I kept those friends, but the Bishop at the time, he would later go on to be my stake president when I was on my mission. He had six daughters and a son. And he said, Girl Scouting builds leaders and women aren't supposed to be leaders. He would know oh. be in Girl Scouting. Yeah. Wow. And um, every summer I would go to camp, this beautiful camp above Park City, Utah. And he would try to bribe me. You stay home this summer and I'll give you your young women's medallion or I'll give you this award. And I'm like, mm, oh. yeah, not worth it. Oh, my God. Wait, yeah. The bishop? yeah, the bishop. So oh. it was. And I was like, yeah, no, this is not, this is not right. Right. And my parents raised us to be fairly independent. My dad had no sons. So, you know, we were raised to be independent thinkers. And um, so 
I was totally found my niche in Girl Scouting. Plus, I was super busy. I was a straight A student. I played in the uh, orchestra. I played in the um, honors symphony for the district. I um, I danced. I taught dance. I did a gazillion things. And they were always calling and saying, "You need to come and can peaches with the young women." And my mom was like, "No, she doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> I taught her yeah. how to can peaches already. So you know, no, that doesn't matter." Um, so it was really high, high, high pressure situation. Yeah, but yeah. I love it. And I see this a lot in, in successful people where you're aware of what's going on, but you find your niche and, yeah. and you found, you found yourself. You're like, I got it. I see how the system works, whatever I'm going to find, you know, and so you've got orchestra, you've got dance, you've got all these other things that you found your tribe kind of in. So you yeah. did you feel like you had a good social group I then? Okay. I had a massive, excellent social group. So we get to ninth grade and now we're going to go to seminary. And I'm like, this is BS. I'm not going to ah. swear. You guys are going to get a, a day, a period off. And I'm going to take an academic class and you're going to get this release time to walk across off the property to go take an, uh, a religious class. And I'm going to sit my butt in a class of math or English or foreign language, because I started taking Spanish in seventh grade. And you guys are going to go learn about whatever you're going to learn about. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to play this yeah, game. Yeah. So I didn't take seminary. And I thought it was, I thought it was a cop out. I really did. It gave my, my friends who were quite academically inclined and had always been with me in junior high and high school in high academic classes, AP classes and honors and everything. All of a sudden they're like off campus going to seminary. And, and I'm like, mm, this isn't right. Yeah. I don't understand why they get a time to go across the street to take seminary. Right. So um, I didn't do that. Right. But then came senior year and I had a free period. Oh, amazing. I, had all these credits and I had yeah. a free period yeah. and I went, yeah. I'll take seminary. Hmm. But I was like, but I'm an, I'm an overachiever and I don't want to have the little asterisk by my name that says one year completed out of four. Right. Cause I'm an overachiever. So I did three years of home study plus the year of seminary and I graduated <sighs> from seminary. <laughs> Oh no my way. Oh my God. You are an overachiever. I'm an overachiever. Good for you. Yeah. I did not graduate from seminary. <laughs> I don't I even know like, if I did. I'm not. I can't my even remember. My senior year, I was in California and you had to get up at 5.30 yep. in the morning. And I had already graduated early from high school because I was ahead. Yeah. And no way was I going to get up at 5.30 in the morning to get my butt to seminary at 6 and then go home. So I'm like, forget yeah, it. No. My parents were like, no big deal. Yeah. Luckily. But yeah. Luckily. Yeah. yeah. I so did, I, that's yeah. amazing that you pulled that off. Really. Yeah. They didn't really want me to, but I'm stubborn. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you, you mentioned that it was your fault that your parents really stayed active in the church and even ended up going yeah. to the temple. So, like, what so how, did, yeah, how did that so, happen? The year after I graduated college, nine, I mean, high school, 1982, I was working at Girl Scout camp and it was a really rough year in Utah. I don't know. It was one of these years like this year and it snowed on the 4th of July. Yeah. And, and oh. we happened to have a staff that was not, um, they weren't integrated. We got a, we had a lot of BYU hirees instead of traditional Girl Scout hirees. A lot of people quit in the middle of the summer, and we became those of us that stayed became very very tight. And my mother heard rumor through the grapevine that it was just this nest of lesbian people up there working at Cloud Rim. Oh, oh. that's the name of the camp. Sorry, and <laughs> she was super paranoid because she'd already kind of suspected that I might be gay, and she just freaked out. My after the summer, she freaked out. She thought that. I was, you know, I was gay. And so she said, and I was going to be living with them and going to the University of Utah. And that was our arrangement because that was what my parents could afford. And so, um, so they, um, my mom said, okay, after the summer, she's like, okay, my, she's like, we're going to, um, no more Girl Scouts for you. You can't be involved in Girl Scouts. You have to be home. We're all going to church. Um, this is how it's going to be. 
And so that started, yeah, I was the reason why my family went back to church, literally. That so was it was her fear of you being gay mm -hmm. that were like, we need to knuckle down and get this family in order. And so that is interesting. And was it just because you weren't dating and you didn't bring home a boyfriend or, or what, you know, what was your... I had dated. I had this boyfriend and I had, well, I had a friend in high school, this boyfriend. Um, currently, when that happened, he was on his mission. Um, but um, I had dated a couple of guys. I mean, I had friends, but yeah. she'd always been so happy that I wasn't boy crazy. You know, yeah, like every, yeah. she'd always been, oh, Jackie's not boy crazy. Isn't that great? And I'm like, well, I didn't know. I didn't have any words for it. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. Like, yeah, it doesn't bother me. But, you know, to her friends. And then all of a sudden it was like it was a bad thing. And um, yeah, so yeah so that's See, you really know what okay so the 80s that's the AIDS scare so that's when all of the AIDS stuff and there was so much in the news about homosexuality and you know that it probably was being really pushed to the forefront and making people start to go wait my son used a moisturizer you know <laughs> what, what, right. what, what you know what could that be you know uh, that what, you know, I'm trying to, trying to think what would have brought on her, you know, her like, what's happening here type thing, you know? Well, so there was another fear my mother had. I don't really like to tell my mom's story. My mom is, yeah. 80, but, um, she had an aunt who <clears throat> in, um, my mom was 15. So it would have been 1957 who was with her partner. And my great grandmother lived with my great aunt and my great aunt's partner and the partner, she got drunk one night and she took a shotgun and she killed, she shot my great grandmother and she shot my great aunt and she shot herself and she oh killed God. all three of them. So oh. I think that horrific gun trauma experience was also in my mom's back of my mom's mind that yes. this is a horrible thing. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, That's um, I could see that. That makes a lot of sense to where one it was a causation thing where mm -hmm. in actuality it wasn't. But I could see where back in the 50s and the 60s, you would try to put things together. That yeah. makes sense. So yeah. so you are kind of doing your thing and you are determined that whatever people this is where I'm headed. And you went off to University of Utah. Um, yeah. You chose that school because of the curriculum and it had the school. What made you go there? I wanted to go to Utah State, okay. but I was going into I want at the time I was going into metallurgical engineering. Oh. And in the 1980s, that was going to be like a big thing for women. Um, and I would have had to eventually have transferred back to the University of Utah anyway, since my parents had told me that they couldn't afford to send me to Colorado to the College of Mines, which had wanted me, but we didn't have enough oh. money to send me there. So the cheapest thing to do was to keep me at home and send me to a commuter school. So I did that. And then um, and I, I, so I registered there and um, then I joined that fall as I entered as a freshman, well, sophomore, junior status. Um, I joined Lambda Delta Sigma the LDS camp, the LDS sorority at the University of Utah, which no longer exists. Okay. But it, talk, I, about, talk about that because that you mentioned that that was very instrumental in your life. And it's sad that they've done away with some of yeah. these groups that really, I don't know, it was a, they were good training grounds on some, in some instances I can see where they're not, but talk about that, how that influenced you. Well, it was very clear that my parents were not going to let me join Greek life. <laughs> This was oh. not going to happen. It was expensive. It was all about the drinking. And then you had to live on campus in the Greek house, right? Uh, okay. So Greek was not going to happen. Right. So my mom, I don't know how my mom found out. She has her ways. She said, what about this Lambda Delta Sigma thing? So I went to Rush reluctantly. I'm like, Ugh, okay, I'll go to Rush, whatever, mom. And I was super depressed because we were having these arguments like on a daily basis about Girl Scouts and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And... um and super depressed and so i go to rush which was a long a, a week long of activities and at the time there were i think nine different chapters of lambda delta sigma which meant at the institute at the university of utah and um it was rushed like a greek rush so you would go every night would be different activities mm -hmm. and um 
I was really drawn to this one chapter called Kapanu. And I went in and then all of a sudden this one person caught my eye and I realized that she had been, she was a member of Kapanu. She had been my counselor at camp one year when I was younger. So oh. I formed this connection with her. Now the group that I ended up joining was strong, strong women. And I'm still in contact with a lot of these women. Um, several of them didn't get married over the years um, and had children on their own, but uh, they don't identify as anything other than LDS. Wow. Um, I, I, it's just amazingly interesting to me. Um, I did meet up. I did one of my, one of my Kappa new sisters. Um, I did run into later on in life down here in Southern California and she is gay and she did have a son. And so, I mean, it's just really interesting, but, um, it was a, it had a different vibe than all the other chapters and I was very comfortable there. So, so you, you could really tell from this chapter that these were strong women. Yeah. They were, they had a, a kind of a, um, uh, what's the word? I can't think of it. The, uh, like a career, they had a career mind. Yes. They there, it wasn't just, Oh, if I could just meet my husband and, and you know, get my home ec, uh, and, you know, thing, I, I'd be great here. So you could sense that, that these were driven women mm -hmm. in many different areas of life, not just home economics or whatever. Correct. Yeah, and then it turned out to be true. Yeah, it did turn out to be true where the other chapters weren't like that. They had a whole different, different vibe, different, different sense. And I knew I wasn't going to fit in with those people. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So. I, I love the fact that so often and I see that I feel like I see that now uh, where there are, you know, we're not we're not of the world, you know, so but we're going to copy the world. Mm -hmm. But we're going to make it our own, which is going to make it better. So we're not going to do Greek, you know, sororities, fraternities. We're going to make our own, but they're exactly the same, except ours are better. You know what I mean? It's like oh, they, you you oh, see oh, the the advantage to these groups, and but they have to put their spin on it. Which hey, kind of like you know, the LDS. Sorry, keep, keep no, no, going. no. Go ahead, Lila. Yeah, I mean, interrupt. I was just thinking, you know, the twelve step program that's been around forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. AA. Well, then, of course, the church has to create their own version of yes, the they have. Right. and interact and bring in, you know, gospel principles into mm -hmm. it and make it better than the one that's been working for, you know, a hundred years. So. Have a yeah. family member going through that right now. Yeah. The 12 church. Yeah. The church version of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I see what you're saying too, Renee, because the, the young women's camp program is rip off of the Girl Scouting program. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course it is. Truly. Yeah. yeah. In including the bandolo and the merit badges. It's, yeah. it's, it's the same it's thing. Totally. Yeah. Only we have to, we love that idea. We're going to take it and make it our own and it's better. And we're going to convince people that it's better because how and dare you get involved in the, unless you're a Boy Scout, then please. Not only get involved in it, but give all your money to it. That that was don't crazy. even not yeah. make sense. Yeah, don't even yeah, yeah, yeah. don't yeah. even yeah. start with that, right? right. Yeah, right. that's right. a whole different thing. Well, and then in in the young women's program, don't forget you have to infuse your testimony in in yeah. order to pass the level. Right. So you got to write in your journal and bear your testimony, and then you and crochet. Pass. Yeah, no, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you graduated, uh, and you graduated with a. Um, I, I just, I'm so impressed with you. You graduated <laughs> with in 1988 with a teaching credential in history and Spanish and a BA in history. Yeah. And so you thought, okay, where are your where are your little sisters in all of this? Oh, are they're you, they're at home. So, well, I served my mission in, before I graduated. So I changed oh. my major. So I, I was attending the University of Utah. I started in 1982 okay. and I attended and I, for 82 to about 83, 84, I was in engineering and I went, Whoa, oh. no, don't like engineers. Don't like engineering. I had scholarships. I said, I was accepted into the college of engineering right out of high yeah. school. I said, you don't like yeah. this. Got rid of all the math and science said bye-bye and went to humanities. Oh, um, okay. So, Totally changed my major, was way happy, um, got accepted into the College of Education, and then said, okay, I need to take a year and a half off because I'm leaving to go on a mission. Oh, okay. Um, 
So from 85 to 87, I served my mission. Okay. So the, oh, I love that then. Okay. So that's the timeline. So, and were you just thrilled when you got your mission call? You went to Argentina. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And yeah. you've been taking Spanish. So is that Spanish speaking? I never can remember. The... Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I was so uh, afraid I was going to get sent to Japan or someplace or <laughs> English speaking after all I, this Spanish in my life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Portuguese. It's like, yeah. I know, but no. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I know. I love the people that have taken four years of German and they get sent to Japan. It's kind of yeah. like, did, yeah. did, you read, did you actually read the, yeah. yeah, I know it doesn't make sense. But you met your wife, your current wife, in the mission home. So tell yes. us about that. Oh, my. So you've taken some time. You're not, you're involved in the sorority. You're loving and you're just, but you're just kind of concentrating on your studies. You've got a great friend group. You're mm -hmm. not looking for love. No. You are, but you have identified. You have identified. Yes, I have at this okay. point. I'm pretty, yes, I am. I've, I don't, my parents have gone through the temple in 1983 then after we'd started this, this journey where my mom said we must go back to church. <laughs> to in save Jackie. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. save. Yeah. Yeah. In 1983, we had gone through the temple. Um, they'd gone and been sealed and I'd go wait in the nursery with my sisters while they were sealed. And then we were brought to them, um, which wasn't a bad experience. I have to admit no. as a 19 yeah. year old, it was, yeah. it was good. At that point that Bishop had said, do you want to take out your endowments? And I said, mm, no, I'm good. Thank you. Um, so that was fine. And then I just, when I was, I, I pretty much, yeah, I'd, I was, I had identified that's who I am, but I was in the space that you didn't have to be that way. This is 1983 after all, right? Oh, 83, yeah. 84, 85. You could just get married. You could repent. You could serve. You could do all that. Oh, just, okay. Just telling you, right? And then you would be fine and everything would be hunky dory and good. So um, I thought if I just served hard enough, I would be better here. Oh, okay. So, so you, okay. did you? I have a question about sure. that. Did sure. you, although you identified as would you say lesbian? That was the word. Probably. That yeah. You used. Did you feel that that was wrong? Like what no, were your internal yeah. feelings about that? Yes. At the definitely time? wrong. Definitely okay. bad, wrong. wrong. Get so rid did you of. feel like yeah. it was something that you could get over and like repent for and sure. it would go away at mm -hmm. some point? Yeah. That was the, oh. That's I'm the so overriding sorry. theme, right? We're talking 19... 19- 1980s. That's what right? we were taught. That's what yeah. we were taught. Yeah. So and yeah, still, I just like, wondered how you internalized that and what that did to you as a person, feeling like somehow you're intrinsically bad. You're bad. You know? Right. So I think that that's part of what has driven me in my life to be perfect, to be part of that is that my mother and my father have always told me you're the eldest and you have to be, you have to be the example. Part of exactly. that is just my personality that I'm like, right. got to do it. Right. But part of that was I had to, I had to do the best. I had to be the best. I had to work to get rid of this thing that was not societal wasn't right. right right? I mean, in society, it was wrong too. We're talking the early eighties. No, oh, yeah. Yeah. It. nobody talked right. about it. If you looked right. it up in a book, which we had to read, we didn't have the internet back then. It, it didn't have anything good to say. Right. 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 So, um, so all of those things led me to think that there's got to be a way that I can serve that will help me to um, get rid of any feelings that I might have or yeah. I might have had, which I did have, ha that I had had in the past, that yeah. I might have in the future, yeah. and will help me to be normal, better, yeah. I don't know, whatever. So and I was going to, uh, that's one of the things I was going to ask you. So you were attracted. There were there were people that you were like, mm -hmm. I love that person. Yes. I would love to date that person. But you were, you kind of talked yourself out of it thinking, no, we're going to be friends because I'm going to get this, you know, I'm going to become an engineer and, you know, and this is okay. I can work through this because I look what you've already worked through, right? Look what you've yeah. already overcome. So this is something else you can overcome. And you had guy friends, like mm -hmm. you said, so you're like, this, 
I could might be, I could might be fight my way through this. This way, yeah, yeah. Actually, that friend that I told you about in in, in sorority mm -hmm. that had been my Girl Scout leader, we would have these coded conversations. Uh, yeah, these coded conversations together. She yeah. um, has since passed away. She's about uh, four years older than I. And yeah. last year, she passed away um, from Alzheimer's. It ran in uh, her family. So I mean, yeah. Boy. but she did move back east and got married to a man uh -huh. so oh. but but we would have co she and i had coded conversations all the time about this was she also lds yes because mm -hmm. she was in yeah sorority too yeah mm. okay. so it was it's insanity i mean the thing is it is partly is it partly because in your youth you don't understand mortality you think you have all this time Mm -hmm. And so you always think, well, I have time to find happiness. I, I'm not going to work on this right now because something's wrong with me. But look what I've been able to overcome. So I have time. And then you get to a certain age where you realize <laughs> I don't have any more time. Exactly. And, you know, and the time has come where I want to find a partner. I want to find a life companion. Obviously, this isn't going to change. So, and I love how you told the story of how you met your wife when you were in the uh, mission training center, but you did not like each other. Well, we hated each other. <laughs> There's no two ways around it. <laughs> and what, what so was that funny. all about? Yeah, what so, was that all about? So, okay, so we go into the missionary training center in September of 85. She's from Northern California and she goes to BYU. Oh, I'm well. from, okay. That explains I'm, it right there. I mean, no right more there, words right? needed. I mean, and I'm from Utah <laughs> and I go to the U. So you've got yeah. Utah Mormon and oh. U of U student and Northern California Mormon and BYU person. And um, we are companions. Um, now this, and then I was like mega role follower because remember I'm here because I want to be, but I'm also here serving a kind of penance, right? I'm going to oh, do everything at the book. Yeah. I'm going to follow all the rules. This is, I'm going to get up at whatever God awful hour in the morning and go do exercise, which I'm not a morning person. And I'm going to follow every single rule in the book and I'm going to do everything I can. And then, um, and she's more laid back, you know, she's not quite this, yeah. this rule follower that I am. And um, we were both going to the same mission. We'd both been called to the same exact mission and it just, it didn't work. And she got called into the branch president and I didn't get called into the branch president. And <laughs> there, there was just, it was a, it was a big mess. And we were in the um, advanced Spanish group. I don't know if you knew that existed because no. they try to get some people, if you speak Spanish going in, they try to get you your visa early so that you can get into the field faster. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But Argentina, Oh, we got to love the LDS church. Argentina had just come out of their cold war and they were barely into their first democracy that they would live through without having have a coup. And starting in 1985, I think it was when Raul Alfonsin was elected and um, they didn't tell us any of that. And so we couldn't get our visas early. So we were stuck in MTC anyway. Oh. And they didn't, they didn't tell our families that they didn't tell us right, that. Right. Right. How long were you stuck there? Just the eight, the eight weeks, the two months, it oh, took just the normal amount of time to get the visas, but they were hoping yeah. to get us out of there. You know, quicker and right. get us down actually, actually um, down there quicker. But they didn't. So once you left the training center and you arrived in Argentina, did you guys stay companions or did they start well, you split everybody up? They okay. split us up. Okay. And she went one way and I went to, I stayed in the city where the mission home was, which is where I would stay for the majority. I would be in that city, in that area for almost half my mission. Wow. And I know it was, it was not cool, but she would go around to different areas. Um, and then about, um, Oh, I don't know. It was July of 86, June, July of 86. I was in a different city, one that was south, closer to the Andes Mountains and closer to Chile. And um, I had had another companion from Louisiana that had really struggled with me, who had who was also gay. And then she had gone to my wife and she was very, very struggling. And my wife called me 
which, you know, you don't do on the phone. And oh. she said, what's up with so-and-so? And I said, she's going to have to tell you herself because she had told me the whole story oh. about how in love with their previous companion and they'd gone to the mission park president, blah, 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 blah. I said, oh. I can't tell you that story. She's going to have to tell you, talk to her. So we started talking to, while well, she's trying to get her to like come out of this funk. And then, um, so we started talking and then we were in the same area, but not ever companions like the next little while. Then I, ha well, then I had my appendix out. Then we ended up in the same area and, um, we wanted to end as companions. Good thing we didn't, they didn't end us as companions, but we, and then we came home in March of 87. Okay. So she, you, everybody, so you, you you go home bye see you later been yeah. nice knowing you um and then you go back to the university you graduate in 88 um, how did you guys get back together because i go back to in march middle of march of 87 and school starts the end of march for okay. spring quarter she comes back from california northern california to start attending byu for spring semester mm -hmm. and when you come back from a mission you don't know anybody, right? I mean, you've been so out of the world, especially yeah. when you're in a foreign country, um, that you kind of gravitate toward people that have been on the mission. So there were quite a few of us that would hang out together. Right. And then she and I just started hanging out together more and more and more and more and more. And here we are 35 years later. <laughs> so now, did she identify as lesbian um, when she was on her mission? No. Um, when did she decide, I I think I'm starting to learn more about myself. When did she, yeah. when did she do that? Mm, maybe. Well, okay. The better question is, maybe when did she identify as a lesbian? Probably mm. not until after we'd been together for a while. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So she's like, to her. it's like, I, I not only like this lady, I think I really like this lady. <laughs> It's very likable. Oh, <laughs> that's so great. It. Yeah. <laughs> so now you guys were together for a long time before it became legal. So were yes. you, were you just kind of the, um, did you feel as, and, and you're going to church? Both of you are going to church? We didn't go to church much. We'd pop okay. in and out if things were, if things were, um, you know, we might go with her parents or we might oh, go okay. if something was going on, but we didn't really attend. Okay. Um, no. And are you living the life where everybody's just looking the other way going, these are just two really good friends <laughs> who are saving money by rooming together and they're both teaching and isn't that nice? Which yeah, is pretty much okay. until 1992, <laughs> okay. um, until 1992 when I came home for Christmas and I don't know what was my mother again. I don't know what was on my mother's plate, but um, we were out Christmas shopping and we were stopped to get something to eat at Wendy's salad bar. And Madonna song was playing on the radio on the, on the music. And I said, I really like this song. And she goes, didn't I teach you better morals? I bet there's a lot of other things that you really like that. I, and she goes on. I go, she goes, are you gay? And I go, <laughs> mom, probably shouldn't have this conversation here in the, in the Wendy's. And she goes, well, I want to know, are you gay? And I go, mom, we should probably go outside. And so that's how that oh, all came about. So then I said, oh yes. Oh my gosh. So in, in, it was, she was right. It was Madonna. It was all it, Madonna's Madonna. fault. Madonna. It, it was on it, Madonna's fault. There you fault. go. It explains go. everything. <laughs> but okay. I love this. So she, you know, so you, you finally are like, yes, I am gay. We're mm -hmm. in love. And she's like, I knew it. Yeah, and then, okay. but but did it didn't break your family apart though, right? Mom mm -hmm. and dad are still like, no, they're still great. They mm -hmm. my they went from like you can never have Terry. That's my wife's name. You can yeah. never have Terry stay at the house because we wouldn't mm -hmm. have your sisters have their boyfriends stay overnight, right? Okay, yeah. So, like within a few months, we went on vacation together. Oh, fine. we were good. That's so great. That's unusual, but that's, that's really that great. Yeah. That's so great. you, you ended up moving to Southern California as a, as a couple. Is that in 1990. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you joined a group, uh, you were, uh, you, you joined affirmation gay and lesbian Mormons. Yep. Talk about that. Oh my. So this, <laughs> is, in my, this is the 1990s and affirmation had been formed in the late seventies. Um, 
and a really good friend of ours, um, his name was Paul Mortensen. He had recently passed away. He had actually been one of the early founders and had for, founded the Los Angeles chapter of Affirmation. Mm -hmm. And Affirmation was a social, is, was, I, we call what they have now Affirmation 2.0, because mm -hmm. a little bit different, the affirmation that exists now, a little bit different than what the founding, because we know the founders, what right. the founders had envisioned for it. Um, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just different. Mm. So um, it was a social and support group for gay and lesbian and LGBTQ, as we've gone on now, mm -hmm. Mormons. Now, mind you that in that day and age, there was no deconstructing on your own, right? You didn't choose to leave on your own. You were forced out. Yeah. So these were mostly men that had been excommunicated. Um, they had gone through the whole gamut of missions. We had bishops and stake presidents and... <sighs> You know, um, we had people that had worked in the hierarchy of the church, you know, in the church office buildings. And we had men that had kids and, um, you know, they had all, all walks of life in the LDS church. Men that had had electro shock therapy at BYU, oh. and, you know, had done all of that. Um, men that had AIDS and men that didn't. And so this was a lot of men, not a lot of women, because women were like patriarchy on my way. Anything that uh, reaches Mormonism, I'm not joining. Yeah. So when Terry and I walked in and joined in 1992, it was like, ooh, women. But we really found a community there and we found a lot of friends there. And uh, yeah, so we have a very a lot of our very, very best friends come from that community. And um, it was a very good place to transition to figure out how to to be spiritual in a lot of ways uh -huh. Uh -huh. without being in the church, which is what I think Thrive is trying to help people understand post-Mormonism, how to be spiritual without being in the church, right? Right, Since right. These people weren't wanted in the church and they've been excommunicated and kicked out of the church and their families, a lot of them didn't want them anymore. Um, a lot of them been disowned. You had to find a, a, a way to be... Um, outside the church. And, uh, you know, at that point, there was a lot of, do I, some people were still grappling with, do I stay in the church or do I leave the church? Can I work within the church? Um, and, and, and everybody was all, you know, everybody had to find their own path. And it was a lot of just support of right. supporting people through that transition. Of, right. um, but where being, were you? But, like, where were you sitting with the church at that point? You know, because of how I had been as a teenager, and because I think I'd started deconstructing a lot of things when I was little. My grandmother passed away when I was five. She wasn't LDS. She drank and smoked. I spent every day. I was at her house every day of my life. And at that point, it didn't make sense. Three levels of heaven. So I had already deconstructed heaven when I was five. So wow. I think that I had, I think I had already deconstructed a lot of things. So for me, that easing out of I had been in and out in my life journey, in, out, in, out as I had gone along. So I was yeah. pretty much, uh, I was good at going in and out, in and out, in and out. Mm -hmm. and so, and talk about that then, because I, I think that is the most amazing thing to me, being somebody who probably is good in, in some ways, but not good in other ways where I make decisions quickly, right? So I yeah. make decisions quickly. And so for me, it was like when I found out A, B, and C, I'm like, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And, but I also had a husband and a house over, you know, roof over my head and kids that weren't necessarily, I mean, I had a lot of reasons where it was easier for me to do that, but you, in spite of even joining in 1992, you went on to also join another group called Maybe Baby, which helped uh, gay and lesbian couples have children. Mm -hmm. So talk about that. So you're, you're kind of you're still Mormon. Yeah. This group had nothing to do with Mormonism. Okay. It was yes. just a group that was in LA that had But you and Terry it. decided we want to have children. We want well, to have a she family. Was just, she was kind of along for the ride. Okay. See, when I was 15, I had told my friend, my, my dearest friend, if I'm not married by the time I'm 30, I'm having kids on my own no matter what. Okay. So that was a big so, part of your, your so life plan. 1992, we're hitting 30. And I'm like, okay, it's, we're getting to that 30. And I told Terry that I want kids and here we are. So how are we going to make this happen? So they had formed this group called maybe baby. And it was because at this time 
um, California was really moving in a direction of allowing same-sex couples to be able to adopt and do surrogacy wow. and, and all these other things. And um, there had been a lot of um, in vitro and um, all that kind of stuff. So we joined this group and it would meet, um, I think it was once a month. I can't remember. And we would talk about different, different ways of um, becoming parents um, they would have guest speakers come in. They would have the judge that did the first second parent adoption in the country come in and tell us, you know, about talk to us about that. Um, so it was all kinds of really, really good information. Um, but it was really interesting sitting in that group because you would introduce yourself, you know, and right. say, um, we're Jackie and Terry and we're from, you know, we're we're from where we're from and and um and sometimes you know it would come up that we were lds that we we're mormon and that people were just like that would freak people out how can you be mormon i mean that was like a bigger thing in yeah. a groups yeah when we in our, introduce ourselves as being mormon than anything else that would freak people out more than anything how can yeah. you be mormon yeah and more, at Makes this sense. point we're identifying more like as a cultural thing I think in some ways more than like as a religious thing. Although I can't, I can't say that some of the religion things, you know, I still aren't bad. Right. Um, that some things that we were taught were okay. Yeah. Good, maybe even, but you know, definitely culturally, I think you can't take Mormons out of their cultural. No, thing. no, it's too woven in every fiber for yeah. sure. So, yeah. but, but you weren't necessarily treated badly. People were just no. like, how can you belong to that weird cult? That weird group. And, yeah. <laughs> so, but through that, through that, I what a wonderful resource. Yeah, through, it was. The, through that association, then you were able to have, and you had physically, you gave birth to both your children. Yeah. So okay. in um, 1996, I um, gave birth to our daughter. Um, she'll, so she'll be 27 in May. Wow. And um, she... She has, she has her own story, but, and then, um, in 1999, I gave birth to our son and then, um, our daughter, I always have to do the math. So she was five in 2001 and she started kindergarten and that year Terry did the second parent adoption and she adopted both of them so that she would have all the legal rights to them as their second parent, okay. which wasn't, it, it cost a lot of money. Because at the time that if you, if we were a straight couple and she was doing a second parent adoption, like the father had abandoned them and she were the man I had married, yeah, it yeah. would have been like $800. <gasps> yeah. But because of how, of how it was, we had to hire a lawyer. We had to have a social worker. We had to have home visits. We had to do, we had to do all this and it was $5,000. So yeah, it was a lot of money. But you were married. Right. No, not at that point, not at 2000. Oh, not at, okay. Oh, okay. Not that right. makes sense. A I see. Okay. okay. So I'm these are just, you're just two stuff. people trying to adopt these. Two. Okay. So then they um, got, they have their birth certificates now that have, that then had us both listed. Their original birth certificate had my name as mother and under father, it had, um, ref I can't remember how I put it refused to stay Donor. it wasn't like unknown or yeah it was something that was different that was like not like unknown because we kind of yeah. knew the donor yeah. but yeah it wasn't donor either so i don't remember what we put so they have an original and, yeah. <laughs> yeah and now they have <laughs> yeah and then they have their other ones now that have terry as their i think it just says crossed off and it has parent and then it has her name on it i see okay okay Interesting. Who knew? Yeah. Five thousand. Five thousand. Be... Oh. Put on a birth certificate. But yeah. I had to go to court and everything with the judge, and they got little teddy bears, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> with our lawyer. Amazing. So it's and so you're there with the. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But what I think is even more amazing is that in 1996, you are <laughs> having this baby blessed yes, yes, in the did. LDS church. Mm -hmm. So please talk to us about that mind control issue. 
I word. don't even know what we were thinking. <laughs> but for both of us, it was super. See, we're still in. It's okay? automatic. In. It's just automatic. It's, it's an so automatic special. thing, right? It's important you give this baby a blessing and a name in case something happens, right? Yeah. So it's, you can't get away. But we put our twist on it. So now you have to understand on the blessing certificate, there's not going to be a father's name. Because there's no father. They're just me. And when we do the blessing circle, we don't care who's in it. We've got um, uncles in it that haven't, you know, don't really honor their priesthood, but they have it. We've got gay uncles in it because our gay friends woo-hoo. from Affirmation came. We oh. got grandpa and grandpa in our circle. We would have had women in the circle if we thought we could have gotten away with it in 1996. So yeah. our this circle was huge. Now, and does the was, bishop know, or did you just have yeah. to say, oh, no, these, uh, they, we've invited we just this wonderful. We just said anybody that has been invited, join the circle. And the and bishop so all of, wasn't and like making the connection. It's like, I invited this guy, I met him at Denny's yesterday, but you know, it's <laughs> because we're so used to the rote activity they just assumed. Yeah. Right. So all of our friends that came from California and came for the blessing and the same with our sons in 1999, same thing. They just, anybody that was felt like they could be involved. Can't, I mean, it was up to them. We would invite them. And if they felt yeah. like they wanted to, they would, they went up and stood in the circle with my dad and Terry's dad as they blessed the baby. So Okay, so your both your fathers were the actual priesthood people yes. that, that gave the blessing. And this was the ward that you oh no, this wasn't even the ward you were attending. How did you get that? Uh it was grandma and grandpa's ward. Okay. And so oh, they were like, How come you don't want to bless in the ward you're attending? They didn't question that. Yeah, because it's a grandparent's ward. You do that all the time. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. okay. So the and kids it was the names ward I grew up in, right? So we did oh. it. Oh so it's my child, my my ward I grew up in, and my parents' ward. So we're good to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So were you even attending at the time anywhere? Regular? Not really. Mm-mm. No. Okay. But now our daughter gets older. Ooh, okay. Okay. She gets to be about eight. And she says, oh. I think I want to be back. Oh, no, yeah. no, they know. They know. They, they're, they're clear on this. No, they yeah. know they're donors. There's no dad. Yeah. Okay. There's yeah. no dad. They're very clear. Both of them on that. We've never... Okay. That's never been a point. They know they're donor babies. They're good. One's got one donor. One's got another donor, but they're both mine. So we're all clear yeah. on that. So they, they're they really good on that. They're both very proud of that. And they're they're really good at that. So, but she does get a little bit older now. And she okay. starts thinking maybe she wants to be baptized. Because Has occasionally, how, what is her affiliation with the church that even gives yeah. her that? Cousins. Oh. Cousin, grandma and grandpa, grandma and grandpa. Okay, those yeah. darn family. Okay, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, maybe I do want to do this weird baptism yeah. thing that they're talking about mm-hmm. that I should do. So we say, well, if you want to do this weird baptism thing that they're talking about, we all have to go back to church. Oh. Mm. So guess who starts? For how long? <laughs> do you it was do it a long time. time. <laughs> That's oh. all I remember. <laughs> So you and went you back felt, to church oh, for her. You her showed up at the door. Your family were here. All and the us. kids are in primary and you guys are sitting in Relief Society. Every Sunday? Yeah, Every Sunday. Jared said, do we have to go to the long meeting again? <laughs> and you, so, so she's baptized in 2000, what? Four. She's baptized Come in 2004. Yeah. And you're like, we're going to do this for the kids. Mm-hmm. We're going back. He's going to be, you know, and was he baptized? Was your son baptized as well then? Because you're now you're in the, no. Okay. No, because he's, he's younger than her. Okay. So he's enough younger. Uh-huh. Okay. So now we're going along. We're cruising. We've been going to church. We're going, we go, no, we're not, we've not been going as much, but we still go to church. And we, our bishop is very good, very good. Our bishop is very open. He's very, he knows who we are. He lists us family on the ward directory. Um, it's all very good. I'm sure there were, there were many. And remember, we're teaching because we both taught at the same high school and we teach in the ward that we attend. So oh, many of the kids. 
uh, uh, Spanish. So oh. we both teach Spanish oh. and we both That's teach like, the high school. And the okay. high school is where we, we, the high school is in the ward where we attend. So Got our it. students are in our ward, our students. So we're like, we're mixing and mingling. So this is like, you know, this is no big secret. We're out there. So 2008 rolls along, around. Lovely year, 2008. Yeah. Jared is gonna, he's eight, gonna be nine. Um. um and he's, um, and now he's thinking about being baptized. Okay, maybe we're going to be baptized. But 2008, yes, sharp intake to breath. This is prop Proposition 8. Not a pretty year here in Southern California. Not a year, a pretty year anywhere in California as far as the church goes. This was really a, this was really a, a deal breaker for me. I mean, we'd been through the proclamation of the family. We'd been through the um, Terry and I had been through the September 6th where they, you know, if you're um, feminist, intellectual or homosexual, yeah, you know, gotta, the yeah. church, you know, that whole thing. Um, so now we're back to, um, we're back to, and we, we, here we are family and, you know, the proclamation of families all over everywhere we go, but now we're prop eight and you can't, you can't understand how bad it was unless you lived here. Yeah. I didn't even know about it. I mean, I'm up in Oregon and I'm in this little bubble. I, I remember hearing that um, Tom Hanks hates Mormons. And I was like, Toy Story Tom Hanks? He, <laughs> why would he hate Mormons? We're such nice people. It wasn't until three years ago when I read Greg Prince's book, Mormonism and the Gays, and I found out about Prop 8. That's how just bubble living your life. It doesn't affect me. Therefore, I don't know anything about it. Amazing. And yeah. um, where we live... Uh, when we moved here in 1990, everybody's all, why are you coming to Southern California from Utah? And we're like, we're just moving to little Utah. Where we live is very, very LDS, oh. super LDS. Um, and so we're like, it's not it's not a whole lot different than living in Utah. So um, it was it was war. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to sugarcoat yeah. it. Um, kids would come in because Terry and Terry and I were also the co-advisors for the Gay Straight Alliance at the high school, and that was ugly. Um, we had we had kids that were like you 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 weren't you couldn't supposed to discuss that in school, right? Mm -hmm. But we had at this point um, friends' kids were in our classroom, and in fact, one gal that was one student that was mine, her parents we knew. She was also a donor baby and her, she had two moms and it was, it was ugly. It was just ugly. And people were out on the streets protesting and the wards would sign up for times to be out on street corners, certain street corners, they would be assigned street wow. corners to go out and be with their little signs out there. Yep. And, um, and people the church really pushed that. Yep. And they were donating yep. money right and left. And Terry's grandmother was phone banking right and left. And, and it was, uh, it was horrible. I mean, it was horrible. There was one time we were on one of the major intersections and the police had to be called oh. because, because they thought there was going to be a major brawl in the middle of the intersection. I mean, it was emotionally yeah. draining. Did and you it, actually have like, because it was a, a kind of an LDS community, did you have like if let's say you're in the grocery store with your family, people come up to you and say things or, you know, actual physical approaches or did people in church start to kind of separate church. the, you know, the Red Seas parting and oh, you know, type thing. Let me tell you a story. So Cassandra yes. takes dance on Saturday mornings and I'm taking her to dance on Saturday morning. And we drive by a very big intersection and there's our ward out on the corner protesting. And she goes, mom, turn around. And I said, why? <laughs> she goes, I'm going to go back and talk to them. And I said, <gasps> and she's like a seventh grader, right? What are you? She's so say? brave. Yeah. I wonder what where she you, gets that. What okay. are you going to say, Cassandra? Mom, I'm just, I can't believe, I just don't. I'm going to go back and talk to him. I'm like, are you sure? Yes, mom. So I know we're going to be late to dance, but what am I going to do? So I turn around, I take her back, I park in the parking lot. She gets out of the car. She goes up to the group. And it's not just the state, the, the ward, but the stake president's in our, in our ward. So he's oh. there too. She goes up to him and I'm standing back. This is not 
I'm not going to have this fat battle. This is hers, right? She walks up. Why are you doing this? They're all like, what? Why are you out here on this corner? You, you are so nice to my family when we're in church and you say oh, you love us, but now you're out here doing this to us. How can you do this to us? I mean, that is what she said. Yeah. yeah. Why are you doing this? Well, we're just doing they did not know what to do. No, they said we're just doing what the prophet tells us to do. Oh. So, uh-huh. She's like, "Well, how can you do that when you know us? This is just isn't right." And and as they came over to talk to me and I said, "Don't talk to me. She's the one you need to talk to. Yeah. She's the one that wanted to ask you why you're here." And it was, I mean, that was that was the that was the beginning of her deconstruction. <laughs> yeah. I, and yeah. did you, did you yeah. get the rhetoric? Well, we, but we love you. We love you, Jackie, but you know, we just have to follow what the Lord wants us to do. Did you get any of that? Got that the night, the, got that the night, the thing passed. Oh. So, so, um, oh, and then Jared, who's like eight going, turning nine, he writes a letter to the Bishop. He says, Bishop, I don't <laughs> want to be a part of your church. This is, I'm never going to get baptized. Eight-year-old writes a letter yeah. to the bishop. So then the night that the thing, yeah, the night the thing passed, our bishop, who I said very supporting, very nice guy, he's the state president now. He comes to the door with cookies and flowers, and I'm not, oh. I, I'm not letting him in. I said, no, bishop, you, this is not a good time. He goes, I yeah. know you're hurting. He said, I know you're hurting, and I know yeah. this is horrible, but I have to tell you that I'm sure that this is going to, you know, this is going to. Fixed. And I said, I'm like, no, Bishop, I'm just, I just can't even talk to you right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And ew. so that was pretty much the, that was pretty much our prop eight thing, except for we did get married in that small window of opportunity. So that's when Terry and I got married. Okay. So how much, how much window was there? I can't remember between it's legal. It's not legal run May to November. Okay. Whoa. So there so it was May 15th because that's Cassandra's birthday where they came out with the, um, the, the court came out and said, yep, it's legal. And so then everybody got married. And then um, November, of course, was uh, election day because it was November president's election. And because it was a bittersweet election night. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so you, you, now you're legally married, you're changing the kids' birth certificates you're, you've completely stopped going to church altogether. And then how did you hear about the 2015 policy? Mom and dad, family again? Probably Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah, your, I think that's it. And your son is how old at this point? 2015. He graduated in 2017, so he's 15. And yeah. he, he was like... You're not actually in the church. You're not really participating. But when he heard that, he was like, this is this. I have now crossed over into I'm done land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because he had just. OK, so he's in high school. His sister, believe it or not, this young lady that took on the stake president and the ward. She decided she wanted to do four years of seminary. She graduated four oh years of gosh. seminary. Her so friend. <laughs> Her whole thing was she was going to sit there in that class and remind them that she, her family and her existed. She wasn't going to get away with, she wasn't going to let them get away with, with thinking that we weren't around. So, yeah. So that was why. So she graduated from high school in 2014 with four okay, years. Let me, let me show, let me see if I can. Okay. So this is your wedding. Yeah. Two thousand. Uh, yeah, this is your wedding in 2008. And then this is, um, oh, I wanted to talk just a brief amount of time. While you guys were teaching at the school, you had a mass shooting. Yeah, in um, 2019. In 2019. Mm -hmm. And I was going to mention that real quick. I don't know if we have time to go back. But there's those kids. Yeah, there's those, those amazing those amazing kids right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. there's, there's that daughter. And this was at... Uh, uh, Super Bowl? Was this, at a Super this Bowl? is the Rose Bowl. The Rose, oh, the Bowl, Rose Bowl. Bowl. Yeah, for the University of Utah and that other team that beat us and we don't want to talk about it. No, there's no sense in that. <laughs> so yeah, this was, uh, you were, were you teaching when there was the mass shooting at the school? Yes, I was there that morning. 
Both my wife and I were there. Mm -hmm. So just for just a second mention, uh, (sighs) and your kids were there? No, No, they they had both graduated. They had both graduated. Okay. So that, were you in lockdown? Yeah, um, we were in lockdown. Um, The building, yes, it was uh, lockdown, lockdown. This is not a drill. So um, it was right before school started that morning. Um, Then they evacuated our building um, and made us walk to the the park. I, I lose parts of this morning. Right. So, um, well, my wife had one of her students was shot and survived. And she, no. that student actually ran to my wife's room. So no. because that student needed to be triaged, um, they actually, that's why they evacuated our building while it was still a hot zone. Uh, oh. They didn't know where the shooter was at that point. And I, oh. I remember as we were walking out, they, I, I had my backpack on walking and I, I remember thinking and I was the last one in line as I was shepherding kids down and I remember thinking I hope I don't get shot in the back <laughs> oh my gosh <sighs> I, isn't it sad that it has gotten to be when you mentioned the school shooting I was like which one was that I mean yeah, yeah. Even think which one was that and then to have actually experience it well I, I'm telling you Terry you guys, I want to bring up the fact that um, that you guys were you were honored to receive the Mortensen Award for Outstanding Service to Affirmation. I really feel as though you know what what would you say you're doing now? You have absolutely no affiliation with the LDS Church. Did you actually resign your membership? No, I haven't. And um, this uh, we were both um, disfellowshipped after the exclusion policy in 2015. Oh, that's so- fun. Okay. Yeah. So that was just like one of the things to do. Oh, exclusion policy. Let's go through our ward list. Oh, get rid of them. Yeah. Get rid of them. Get, get rid of them. One, this one, this one. Did they yeah, just- and that was on Valentine's Day of 2016. So no. And the purpose of that, because I thought this, the, oh, no. I thought the exclusion policy was children could not be baptized. It didn't say, did it? Was there like, and and also people? Oh, people who were living. Okay, because you were married and living together. Therefore, we have to go through this list. And then they sent you a letter. Did they yep. just say, please appear on Valentine's Day at 930 uh, for your hearing or whatever they call it, disfellowship thing? Yeah. And I decided that we would have a party instead. Oh, excellent. So, I like that. that. I love so, that idea. So and we Terry, had a, was uh, she also disfellowshipped? Yeah. So okay. same day, just earlier hearing in mind. So oh. we had a party at our friend's house where they're... Um, where our friend is, he's had his name removed from the rolls, but his husband was, is no, is a never mo. <laughs> and okay. um, so we used their backyard with the pool and everything. And we had a big party going on. And lo and behold, as this big party is going on, the missionaries show up their front door. Oh, <gasps> come on. Could it be yes, more? I'm right. injury. <laughs> Would oh you like God. to know more about the Mormon church? Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> we would. Yeah. So, yeah. right? So, so now- he, our friend is like this. He invites, oh, elders, come on in. And he's like, yeah, we're having a party party back, back here. here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so babies. funny. So, so, you did not attend. I did your- not go to my hearing. My wife went with our she friend. She went. she went to hers. I didn't go. And it was I wrote a letter. Night. I didn't go. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, I'm not going. And did yeah, they just why? say you have to disavow your marriage and live independently and we'll keep you? Was that They the- didn't tell us anything. They just said, uh-huh. this is the decision. For our son, Whoa. for him to be baptized at that time, he would have to have turned 18, moved out of the house be. and disavowed us as his parents. And then he yeah, could have right. been baptized. Yeah, because that's and really that's, good for family relations. Yeah, to do that's that. really good yeah. for family, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. when he said, family yeah, this church. isn't happening. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not like there hasn't been enough trauma already. Exactly. So what would you say, Jackie, now your kids are like you said, your kids are in their 20s. Uh, they've they've they're kind of forming their own adult life. Um, you and your wife, you've retired, but your wife is continually teaching. You're still active in the gay community. Yes. Tell us what you're doing now. So now I um Right now I'm looking at, well, this is one thing that my therapist told me. She, I was talking to her after I came back from Thrive and she's like, um, she knows, you know, there's a lot of post-Mormons in this 
community. She goes, oh. you really need to start a group. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. And I'm like, yeah. Um, so I would that's actually, that's what I wanted, I would like to do now. Okay. I'd like to get started in that. Um, I just kind of want to, I want to talk, speak out again more. You know, you get pulled out and you get pulled back in. Right. And I got pulled back in when I went to my reunion uh, in July. And I realized that this thing, this cult thing, just, especially if you're going back and forth to Utah, which I do to go visit my mother, oh. pulls you back in, you know, you yeah. just can't escape it. And when my mother-in-law passed away in October, you know, it was a lot of pull you back in again. And, and so there's a lot of it that you just, you can't get away from as long as family's in it. Right. Right. So um, that's a lot of why people tell us, we'll just get out of it, then just leave and don't come back in. But it's not that easy. No, it, it, it isn't. Involved. Exactly. So that, that's what you're doing right now. I know, I know that you said that you've started a meetup. And yeah. a, Google, a Google meetup and, and, and that's the, that's the secret right there. And you're also involved though in legislation, because I know when I talked to you, you were in the process of doing something very, uh, very commendable. And I was not, and <laughs> I was like, well, that's the difference between you and me. So you are, uh, you are working in Sacramento and lobby le lobbying legislatures. And what are you exactly going for well, we that was just the one day we were up there. I'm actually involved with the group Moms Demand Action um, mm -hmm. for Common Sense Gun Laws. And oh. it just barely started getting, it's not just moms, it's anybody that wants to join. But I just started getting um, involved in that because I realized that my story and my voice as a survivor of gun violence hadn't been heard often. Exactly. And um, my story kind of gets lost with my wife's because hers is so much more interesting than mine. Right. Um, so uh, I, I decided I needed a place to tell my story. And yeah. I, I decided I would start working with Moms Demand Action. And um, I like it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, as usual, you're, you're involved, you're, and I, you're resilient. And I just, I just love your can do. And the, and the, it doesn't, it doesn't, defeats you. I mean, you don't have a defeatist attitude. And I think that's what I saw in, in, in at Thrive was this person that was like, oh, really? Now let me show you what's going to happen. Yeah. And I think that's the only way things get changed. And that's the only way there's movement made. And I just appreciated you standing up and, and saying, let me tell you about where I'm at and what you've gone through. You've got two beautiful children that have had to live through some trauma that wasn't necessary. And I just think that's amazing that they are as strong as they are because of the parents that they have. Thank so you. I just appreciate it so much. So Lila, thank you so much for joining us today. I, Lila oh, I was is, um, was there. And I really, I, I think that we both agreed that it was one of the better thrive meetings that we've been to. I just felt like there was a, there was a, a very mature, um, kind feeling over this, this particular thrive. I, I really loved it. It was great. And, and yeah. uh, so that's why I invited her to, to be here with you. I've so, never been yeah. to thrive before. That was my first oh. thrive. I was, I, I had been so, because we used to have conferences for affirmation every year. Oh yeah. I totally love those. And it was, but this was very, I, I really enjoyed it. I was, wow made That's new excellent. friends, met new people like you guys. Yeah, and I'm yeah. just, it was very much, um, I needed it. Yeah. I needed exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and it was another example of the fact that, um, even in some, I, I'm involved in another deconstruction where it's just Christianity in general, but we do need people as much as we think we can do stuff on our own. We can't, we That's do true. need, we do need a tribe of some kind. And, and when you, when it's something as involved as religion, um, you have to be with other people that understand your lingo mm -hmm. and, and the rituals and all of the other things. So that, that is, it was a, it was a true blessing and a great weekend. Well, ladies, I don't know what your weather's like. It's really cruddy here in Houston, but whatever you're doing today, go and do be with your families, go enjoy the rest of the day. I appreciate so much. And Jackie, I think we're probably going to hear from you again. Okay. <laughs> Very much. I hope so. Uh, uh, maybe maybe yeah. you and Terry together, right? Lila? Uh, maybe. We'll see if we can get her on. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. 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 yeah, I have so many more questions I would love to ask you sometime. So yeah. let's do that. Let's yeah. let's do, do that. this again. That would That'd be, be great. so great. 
All okay. right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you so bye much bye. for having me. Okay. Have a great spring. Spring you is too. coming. <laughs> yes. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh my gosh. Just another example of resilient, strong women. I love surrounding myself with strong, resilient women who go along, go along, go along. And then at some point they say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I need to stand up and become visible and be who I really am. And I think uh, Jackie and, and Lila as well are perfect examples of that. So oh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you again next week. And thank you for joining us on She Became Visible.